Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Irving Weber lecture. Um, tonight's, well, for all of you who are from Iowa City, you know who Irving Weber was. Irving Weber was the town's official historian, but in addition to that and before that, he was a business person. He bought into a local dairy and started the Quality Checked Dairy Association. He, when he was at the university before that, he was a swimmer, a very, very good swimmer. Um, but after he joined and formed the Quality Checked Dairy Association, Irving was born in 1900 or 1910. I'm sorry, I always forget. That's about right. Yeah, yeah because he lived to be the ripe old age of close to 100. And in his later years, he started writing a column for the Press Citizen. And he wrote over 800 columns, and they were all about his Iowa City, his remembrances of growing up in Iowa City. We have them upstairs in a set of books which are actual photocopies of those articles. But they were also turned into a series of books called Irving Weber's Iowa City. We have those too, and you can check them out. Uh, but they're wonderful. And in 1989, about five or six years before he passed away, he was made the official Iowa City historian. He has done video programs for the library. He has, you know, we have all these papers. He's just an amazing man. So every year in May, we celebrate Irving Weber Month or Irving Weber Days, depending on what we put on the advertising for the year. And we do programs about local history because local history is important and it's one of those things you never want to forget. Now, since Irving has been gone, there is a young gentleman in town who has taken it upon himself to carry on <laughs> Irving's mantle and is now the unofficial official historian, Dr. Tom Shuline. And he is here tonight to tell us about the Finkbein family. And it has a whole lot more to do than about just a golf course. So Tom, you can come up and tell your story and how you got into history. I want to thank you, Beth, for inviting me to do this. And I believe you did last year too, so thank you for that. And uh, I consider myself an historical investigator because I'm not a trained historian, but I've had an intense interest in Iowa City history, been working on it for going on 10 years. And I have some 30 odd programs that I give on various aspects of Iowa City history. So last year I took it upon myself to learn about the Finkbines. Having golfed at the Finkbein golf course and known the name only through that and a couple of other associations. Any golfers in the audience who, okay. Anyway, I think you'll find that there's a lot, a lot of information that's beyond golf. But my little synopsis was the name of a golf course known to all but who was Finkbein? The Finkbein name impacted other parts of the University of Iowa, influenced greater Iowa City, the state of Iowa, and beyond. This is the story of an Iowa Finkbein family. Finkbein Field, this is a quote, Finkbein Field, the University of Iowa's golf course, will be officially opened on Friday, October 16. Thus began an article in the Iowa City Press Citizen on October 2nd, 1925. What we see here is probably the most widely seen photograph of Uncle Billy, as W.O. Finkbein sometimes referred to himself. He's getting ready to tee off for the ceremonial opening of the University of Iowa golf course. In what other context do we know the Finkbein name? Well, well, we'll explore that. Our story begins with Robert Finkbein. Robert Spencer Finkbein was born in Oxford, Ohio, near Cincinnati in 1828, where he grew up, was schooled, and learned the trade of carpentry. And in 1850, when he was 22 years old, he moved to Iowa City, making the trip via boat to Cairo, Illinois, then up the Mississippi River to Muscatine, 
and finally by stagecoach to Iowa City. After establishing himself in business here, he returned to Ohio to claim his bride, Rebecca Finch, F-I-N-C-H, and returned with her to Iowa City. Finkbein had skills beyond that of a good carpenter. He, those included a knowledge of all branches of the building construction, and his reputation soon extended beyond Iowa City. Roberta and Robert lived on Kirkwood Avenue. From 1853 to 1867, four boys were born to them. In Iowa City, Finkbein was associated with Chauncey Lovelace in the, in the contracting firm of Finkbein and Lovelace. One of their projects was the construction of stables and sheds associated with the stagecoach business occupying Block 25. Block 25 in the original 1939 plat of Iowa City is bordered by Johnson and Dodge Streets and Iowa Avenue and Jefferson Street. Some of you may recognize the brick building on the corner there. The southeast corner of the block is occupied by a familiar building, now housing a restaurant called Perez Family Tacos. Many of you remember the Maid Right, Lou Henry, and other restaurants that were once there. And on the other corner, the southeast corner of the block, I'm sorry, the, the wind on the southwest corner is the Windrum Greenhouse, we think built around 1850. We don't have an exact date. And some think it was once a stagecoach stop or maybe an overnight resting place. That's very feasible since this block was associated with the building of stagecoaches and harnesses and Iowa City was a busy crossroads for stagecoach lines. Over 100 horses were once stabled on the block and Iowa City was once on about 14 stagecoach routes. One author offered that in the decade of the 1850s, little boys dreamed of becoming stagecoach drivers when they grew up. In our day, little boys often want to become policemen or firemen. Even after the arrival of the railroad in Iowa City in 1856, stagecoaches flourished because they were only, the railroad went east to west, and we had routes going in all different directions, probably through about 19, or 1870 with the stagecoaches. One of Finkbein's earliest friends in Iowa City was our famous Civil War governor, Samuel Kirkwood. <clears throat> As a fellow delegate to a state convention in 1856, Finkbein called upon Kirkwood to deliver a speech, and this became Kirkwood's introduction to public life in Iowa. Kirkwood and Finkbein remained lifelong friends. Finkbein did contract work for the state, including some at the University of Iowa, and were connected with many other public buildings in Iowa. For example, Finkbein and Lovelace included, were awarded the contract for a building at the Blind Asylum at Vinton, Iowa, later known as the Iowa Braille and Sight Saving School. Many of you have seen this place on Market Street, it's the limestone nicking house built in 1854. It's on Market Street just north of John's Grocery. It was built by Finkbein and Lovelace in 1854. Robert Finkbein was the architect of Calvin Hall. Calvin Hall was constructed in 1884 and sat on the northeast corner of the Pentecrest and was originally named Science Hall. Well, in the late 1890s, George McLean became president of the University of Iowa, and one of his dreams was to create symmetry around the old capital by establishing four similar-looking structures on the four corners of the Pentecrest. The Pentecrest name was not adopted for this site until the 1920s, and it wasn't until 1975 that the Pentecrest had only today's five buildings. In fact, over its history, the Pentecost had at least 17 different buildings. And when it was named the Pentecost, it had more than five buildings. Named by a dental student, by the way. Science Hall was less than 20 years old when in 1904, construction was to begin on McBride Hall. And this would require the demolition of Science Hall. But Professor Samuel Calvin declared, quote, a good brick building shouldn't go to waste. 
So he and Professor Thomas McBride proposed moving the building. A Chicago firm was found that could move the building, considering it to be a little job, even though it would represent quite a feat. So the building was raised using nearly 800 jack screws placed on wooden rollers, and the 6,000-ton building was moved about two feet per day with a record of 17 feet of movement in one day. This took months during the move, but all the while, classes were held continuously within the building. In 1905, Science Hall was moved to the northwest and rotated into position on Jefferson Street, where it stands today. In 1964, it was renamed Calvin Hall. With the preservation of Calvin Hall, I think we have one of the most beautiful buildings on campus. Here's another old university building. In 1865, Robert Finkbein was named superintendent of construction of North Hall, which stood directly north of the old Capitol on the Pentecrest. At that time, there were three buildings on the Pentecrest, South Hall, the Old Capitol, and North Hall. This is a view of North Hall as if it is standing by itself on the Pentecrest. You can see houses on Jefferson Street where Calvin Hall and Halsey Hall now stand. Well, in 1897, lightning struck North Hall, and a fire broke out that gutted the building, which at that time housed the university library. And while fighting the fire, a man named Lysurgis Leek became the first Iowa City fireman to die on duty, and there have only been two. The only other fireman to die from injuries sustained while on duty was Robert Hine in 1971. One of his sons, and he had 13 or 14 children, is the manager, I'll say, of Pleasant Valley Golf Course. He's a golf pro. Well, only a shell of the building remained and almost the entire collection of books, some 25,000, were lost. At that time, North Hall housed the largest academic library west of the Mississippi River. Rather than approve the building of a new fireproof structure, the state legislature voted instead to repair North Hall, and the library was again established there. It wasn't until 1941 that the legislature finally funded a new library building that was completed in 1951 as the original part of today's library, main university library. North Hall remained until 1949 when it was demolished as seen on the right. Old North Hall is not to be confused with today's North Hall, which sits about three blocks further to the north down the T.N. Cleary walkway. This was built in 1925 as the new home for the university elementary and high school programs, commonly referred to as UHI. Robert Finkbein also designed this 1877 structure, which was built in downtown Iowa City. The second owners turned it into what was called the Cauldron Opera House. The name's a bit of a misnomer because not many operas were performed there. It was usually stage theater. It was considered the finest theater in Iowa City, using the upper two stories as the performance venue, with the first floor housing a bank and other businesses. And the building still stands, but has undergone extensive exterior and interior alterations and is no longer recognizable as seen here. Does anyone know where it is? So it's on the southeast corner of College and Clinton Streets, directly east of the old Capitol Town Center. I believe it still has a Wells Fargo bank there, correct? Well, Robert Finkbein was elected to the Iowa State Legislature and served two terms in the 1860s. In 1873, he was chosen as superintendent of construction for a new Capitol building to be erected in Des Moines. Now, as a bit of trivia, our state capitol building is the only five-domed capitol in the United States. This is where Finkbein really cemented his already good reputation. 
He labored tirelessly on the building process, which extended for 13 years from 1873 to 1886. He entered the project after a previous contractor created a faulty foundation, so Finkbein had the work from the ground up. In 1880, he and his family moved to Des Moines so that he could supervise the day-by-day -day construction. He rejected high bids, knowing exactly what each stage of the construction should cost, yet he worked cordially with all involved and was praised for keeping costs down for his intimate knowledge of all phases of the construction and above all, for his utmost integrity. When auditors submitted their report to the Iowa governor, the only discrepancy they reported from an expenditure of over $2,800,000 was for $3.73. To that, Finkbein said the accountants must have made the mistake. Finkbein was against the gilding of the dome, thinking it a bit frivolous and so a waste of funds. Fortunately for those of us who appreciate the Golden Dome, Finkbein was overruled and the dome was gilded and remains so today. <clears throat> Robert S. Finkbein died in 1901 at the age of 73. And from his obituary in the Iowa State Register, I found this, this quote, Mr. Finkbein was interested in the Green Bay Lumber Company and had other property. We'll, we'll discuss that Green Bay Lumber Company shortly. He was not a wealthy man in the recent sense, but he was considered well-to-do. So just what was meant by interested in a lumber company, I don't know, but the Finkbein children were to spend their careers in the lumber industry. In 1853, Charles Albert Finkbein was born to Robert and Rebecca Finkbein. He received his law degree from the University of Iowa and practiced law for a short time. But in 1882, he founded what he called the Wisconsin Lumber Company of Des Moines and remained its president until his death. The company later had 10 lumber yards in Western Iowa. And two years later, Edward Clarence was born usually referred to as E.C. E.C. attended the University of Iowa where he starred on the baseball team. And in 1879, along with James G. Berryhill, he founded the Green Bay Lumber Company of Otebolt, Iowa. E.C. is shown here with his brother Charles, both members of a championship baseball team during the 1870s. In 1857, William Orlando was born, usually referred to as W.O., and he earned both undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Iowa. Upon his graduation from law school, W.O. joined his brother E.C. in the Green Bay Lumber Company business. And finally, a fourth son, Henry Moore, was born in 1867. He was known as Harry. He was a resident of Atlantic, Iowa, and spent his over 50 year career with his brothers with the Green Bay Lumber Company serving as company auditor. What do you suppose the Green Bay name stems from? Well, since Charles Finkbein formed the Wisconsin Lumber Company and EC the Green Bay Lumber Company, my thoughts turned to Green Bay, Wisconsin. That does not seem to be the case. An old man in Otebolt, Iowa, suggested the Green Bay name. This man called attention to the fact that Mr. Finkbein had begun with one lumber yard and was adding more and spreading out over Iowa. This suggested to the man the name of Green Bay for the company because of a passage in one of the Psalms of the Bible where it mentions spreading himself like a Green Bay tree. Well, why was Otebolt chosen? It had a population of only about 600 in 1880, and today it has less than 1,000. I don't have an answer for that. But EC and WO were in the lumber business together for almost 50 years, and they expanded to a network of about 50 lumber yards throughout western Iowa. In other ventures, they accumulated great wealth in minerals 
and in sand and gravel sales. The brothers also owned a 17,000 acre wheat farm in Canada. E.C. once said he was a businessman who, quote, didn't like to work at a desk. He found his greatest outdoor diversion on, in, on golf courses, and he was a member of the Des Moines Club and Wakanda Club. In 1901, W.O. and E.C. Finkbein and W.E. Guild founded the Finkbein Lumber Company, later called the Finkbein Guild Lumber Company. They purchased 25,000 acres of timberland in southern Mississippi to harvest and market the virgin stands of longleaf pine trees. Here's the location of the timberland shown within the borders of Mississippi, down in southern Mississippi. Well, sawmills were established and railroad spur lines were laid into the logging areas. The company shipped the milled lumber to domestic and export markets using Gulfport, Mississippi as their export hub. A company store, school, church, YMCA, barbershop, post office, and doctor's office were all built in a company town they established, a town they called Finkbein. <laughs> but after World War I began in 1914, the export lumber business was lost because the greater part of the timber had been sold to Germany and Belgium. My map here shows the range of longleaf pine forests. Wood from these trees was valuable because it was straight and durable. With the Mississippi timberlands almost exhausted, the Finkbines looked to California with the idea of harvesting trees from the redwood forests. In 1925, they purchased 25,000 acres of redwood timber on the Pacific coast, about 140 miles north of San Francisco near Rockport. The timber would be cut and shipped to the Finkbine sawmills in southern Mississippi. Four steel ships were purchased, each one 400 feet long, capable of carrying 7,000 tons. Passage through the Panama Canal would be necessary. After only two years, the California Redwood experiment failed because of high shipping costs and other factors. By 1929, the supply of virgin pine in Mississippi was depleted, and the Finkbines sold all of their timberlands. The Finkbine Guild Company then began construction of a factory in Mississippi to process farm produce. The American Pickle and Canning Company was created to process pickles, tomatoes, beans, and sweet potatoes, but soon pickles became the only product. At one time, they reportedly had the largest pickle processing plant in the world. After changing, changes of ownership, the pickle factory eventually became part of Beatrice Foods, and the factory in southern Mississippi closed in 1983. I've been talking about 25,000 acres. To put that in perspective, each of the black areas represents 25,000 acres. That's more than the area of Iowa City and Coralville combined. And if we were to head north on Interstate 380, starting at I-80, a swath of land two and a half miles wide, all the way to Highway 30 on the south edge of Cedar Rapids would comprise 25,000 acres. It's a lot of land. I found that in 1901, W.O. was on the verge of purchasing additional vast timberlands in Mexico, but I don't know if the deal was closed. Shortly before W.O. died, he wrote to his daughter, explaining his start in the lumber business, which was in 1880, that it is when he started. And here's a quote. I was utterly helpless. I did not know what shiplap was. I did not know the difference between a two by four and a two by six. And I could not, without going to my books, figure out how many feet in a two by four, 16 feet long. And I guess I was a great disappointment to the man who was running the yard and who had to introduce me as the new manager of the yard. Now I'm going to turn to the subject of golf to help develop a connection of the Fink Mines with golf. The modern game of golf probably originated in Scotland dating perhaps as long back as the 1400s or 1500s. To many golfers, the old course of St. Andrews seen here is considered to be a mecca for golfers. 
It wasn't until the late 1800s that golf reached the United States. The first golf courses in the United States date to the, probably the 1890s. And golf came to the state of Iowa early on when the first Des Moines course opened in about 1896. Brothers E.C. and W.O. Finkbein were among the most prominent golfing pioneers of Des Moines. This is a circa 1900 picture showing W.O. second from the left in the first row. E.C.'s son, Robert H. Finkbein, was the Iowa State golf champion in 1900 when he was only 16 years old. In 1902, three members of the Finkbein family were among 10 men from the Des Moines Golf and Country Club who played in the second annual tournament of the Iowa State Golf Association. W.O. Finkbein founded an annual dinner in 1917 as a way to acknowledge Iowa's most prominent student leaders at the University of Iowa. The leadership dinners were originally for presidents of student organizations, but the guest lists were expanded to include some faculty and alumni. The event, the event began as the Finkbein Keenly Dinner, co-sponsored by a prominent Iowan, Carl Keenly. Finkbein hoped the dinners would help the young men attend, attending, quote, to grow a keener sense of personal responsibility, a deeper interest in wise government, a devotion to the public interest, and a sharing of his own dedication to the University of Iowa. Finkbein played host and paid for the dinners in the early years and then endowed them so they would continue after his death in 1930. Similar dinners for women were established in 1927 and then combined with the men's dinners in 1972. Today, the dinner is attended by representative student leaders, faculty, staff, and alumni of the University of Iowa. In 1924, E.C. and W.O. Finkbein, in honor of their father, Robert Spencer, whom I talk quite a bit about, donated about 175 acres of farmland to the University of Iowa. The area outlined here in red was their donation, and it was between Highway 6 and the railroad tracks, which was northeast of today's Finkbein Golf Course. The property was donated specifically for the development of a golf course. Noted golf architect Tom Bendelow designed the course. He was credited with the design of between 600 and 700 golf courses during his career, making him perhaps the most prolific golf course designer worldwide. Also in 1924, Lee and George Kozer established a subdivision they named University Heights and began selling lots. Later, University Heights was incorporated as a city. It was in the 1930s. The Kozers used this bird's eye view of their sales in their sales literature. It shows the golf course extending right up to where Kinnick Stadium is today. The Kozer brothers appropriately named one of their streets in University Heights Golf View Avenue, right across the railroad tracks from the golf course. The 18-hole golf course, at first simply called the Golf Course, or West Side Field, received the official name of Finkbein Field in 1925. Here are a couple of early photos I found in one of the yearbooks of the University of Iowa, and shows the golf team members wearing neckties and knickers and part of the golf course, it was quite undulating. Here's a 1930 view showing the golf course adjacent to Iowa Stadium. The first football game was played in the new Iowa Stadium on October 19, 1929. In 1972, it was renamed in honor of Niall Kinnick, the 1939 Heisman Trophy winner who died during a training flight while serving in World War II. Here's another 1930 view of the golf course and the University Hospital, which was built in 1928. And here's a 1943 campus map 
showing the layout of the 18-hole golf course, showing the number and yardage of each hole. We also note the presence of two lagoons on the West Campus, north of the theater building, today's theater building. Excavation for these lagoons took place in the 1930s, and they were used for canoeing and winter sports, but were removed prior to the early 1970s establishment of the music complex, which included the original Hanser Auditorium. And at the top of the map, it's hard to read here, but it says, to Iowa City Country Club, which is Foster Road, or no, I'm sorry, that's actually Taft Speedway, that little roadway that's shown there. And that got its name because William Howard Taft, when he was Secretary of War under President Roosevelt, was here at a commencement exercise. And he was driven down the road at the fast speed of 40 miles per hour. So they, they renamed it, or named it Taft Speedway. But what this is, the country club included the first golf course in Iowa City, which was established in the year 1900. And in 1947, the golf course and its other property were sold to the Iowa City Elks Lodge. And the golf course remains much as it was originally. Professor Bohumel Schimmick, for whom Schimmick Elementary School in Iowa City and the Schimmick State Forest and other things were named, made plans to place every woody plant that was grown in the state of Iowa on Finkbine Field. This included over 100 trees, nearly 100 shrubs, and about 150 cultivated plants. I think Schimmick would have made a good double for Doc Adams on Gunsmoke. In 1946, a plan was made to place 143 barracks buildings adjacent to the golf course, and they would become known as Finkbine Park, housing for married veteran students and their families. Barracks were installed at 12 university locations to help alleviate a severe housing shortage following World War II. If any of you have been here long enough, you may remember some of those barracks buildings that were up until the early 70s, and there were a certain lesser number of Quonset huts as well. A 1946 newspaper story declared Barrick Village was spreading on Finkbine Golf Course. So part of the golf course had to be reconfigured as a result of the Barrick's placement. Here's a great aerial view showing Finkbine Park. The College of Dentistry building and parking lots now occupy this space. More of the eastern portion of the golf course gave way to a football practice field, a running track, and more barracks. You can see some of them up there by Kinnick Stadium. By 1950, a decision was made to create a new golf course, and so a tract of land of about 270 acres was purchased with athletic funds. It was emphasized that the new course would be paid for entirely by funds from athletic ticket receipts, with no state funds to be used. This new course was built southwest of the original course, situated between Melrose Avenue and the railroad tracks. Built on former farmland, the course displays an almost complete absence of trees. Look at that. There's just hardly anything there. Where's the railroad tracks? The railroad tracks in this picture, Hal, would be on the left off to the left. We're looking kind of east and very slightly north in this view. So we see <coughs> Melrose. Can you see the pointer moving there? There's Melrose, and this would be Mormon Trek right here down below. Boy, didn't it look different then? And that's been, what, 67 years since that golf course was built and trees were planted. The designer of the new course was Robert Bruce Harris, another noted golf architect whose career included the design or remodeling of 150 or more golf courses. So they used good people when they built their university golf courses. There's a lot to it. 
with figuring out the drainage and uh, all kinds of things. Well, in April 1955, as the new 18-hole course neared completion, the remaining western portion of the old course, reduced to only nine holes, opened for play for the 1955 season. The old course is at the bottom of the screen below the red line, which represents the railroad tracks. So south is upward toward the top of the screen. In mid-July 1955, the new Finkbein golf course opened for play. It wasn't the formal opening of the new course, as some work remained. The, next, the formal opening would occur in the 1956 season, but the athletic director said, quote, that it is good to play on a new course rather than let it lie idle. The playing on it this year will help pack the ground and shape up the course for next year. One of the unique features of the new Finkbein course is hole number 13, the so-called water hole, which plays as a choice of two holes, with both greens on peninsulas extending into a small lake. Soon it was dubbed Davy Jones's Locker. Davy Jones's Locker is a metaphor for the bottom of the sea. It is used as a euphemism for drowning or shipwrecks in which the sailors and ships are consigned to the depths of the ocean, just like the hundreds of golf balls that find their way in there. Also, it was noted that after 2 p.m., the new course had no holes that were played into the sun. Today, Finkbein Field is considered one of the best, although challenging, public golf courses in Iowa. It's an absolutely beautiful golf course. So the dark area is all water? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's just a gorgeous golf course. In 1971, the Finkbein Park barracks were removed to make way for parking lots in the new College of Dentistry building, which opened in 1973. And the lower Finkbein nine-hole golf course was later abandoned and gave way to today's Iowa softball track and field complex. So the old course was, you see the highway at the bottom right, up to the railroad tracks, which would be by that first line of trees. To trace the kind of the layout of it, here, here's the old course. This is a 1938 view. I've marked the railroad and Highway 6 and where the UI Hospital and Kinnick are, so it occupied all of that <coughs> land like this. That patch of trees here, by the way, is still there. It's right down at where Hawkins Drive comes down, a little bit before you get to the Wigan Pen. There's kind of a mound of, of a forested area. It's still like that. So Finkbine Park took out some of the golf course there when that was put in. And then it reverted to a nine-hole course. And then there's the present 18-hole, the softball complex, and so forth there. On the view on the screen here, if we go, the bottom right is to the west, and the top left would be going southeast. Okay. Well, you see Carver Hawkeye Arena there, and the dental school, and there's Highway 6, yeah. The Hancher Finkbein Medallion, another connection with the Finkbeins, was established in 1964. It was named for W.O. Finkbein and Virgil M. Hancher, who was the UI president for 24 years. The first medallion was awarded in 1966 to a senior university student. The medallions are awarded each year to two outstanding undergraduate students, two graduate students, one faculty member, and one alumnus. One of my dental students got that award one year. It was, it was very good. To be awarded a Hancher Finkbein medallion is to receive one of the most prestigious awards bestowed by the university. The Amana VIP was conceived during a conversation on a Florida golf course. The brainchild of Amana Refrigeration founder George Forstner and PGA Tour veteran Julius Boros. They planned to bring together PGA professionals, stars of the entertainment world, 
and award-winning Amana distributors and dealers. It would be held for 23 years on the Finkbein course. But the first VIP was held in 1967 in West Virginia without spectators. Iowa Athletic Director Forrest Eveshevsky decided or suggested bringing the tournament to Iowa City. And so it was moved here in 1968 and held until 1990. Not sure why they stopped it. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, such baseball stars as Mickey Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, Roger Maris, and Stan Musial were part of it. Entertainers such as Dinah Shore, Glenn Campbell, and Roy Clark. Even Gerald R. Ford made an appearance. One amusing happening was what I will call the Billy Martin incident. New York Yankees owner George Steinbrenner and Billy Martin were at odds over the years. Billy Martin was the Yankees manager during interrupted intervals. In 1979, when Martin was in the VIP tournament, while not manager of the Yankees, Steinbrenner called the Finkbein clubhouse and demanded that Martin be pulled off the golf course so he could be rehired as manager. Martin was eventually removed from the course on hole 13 and taken to a helicopter and eventually to New York City. Proceeds from the Amana VIP went to the University of Iowa Scholarship Fund. The Finkbeins were a generous family. During Iowa homecomings, W.O. Finkbein frequently paid to bring groups to the university in a special railroad car from Des Moines. W.O. was also one of the first to provide funding for the Iowa Memorial Union. This is what the union building looked like in 1925. Photos quite revealing. You can see the remaining houses that are to the bottom of the screen there. One lady sued over the demolition of her house, but it was probably lost to eminent domain, so she didn't win anyway. <coughs> this photo shows the size of the union today. It was taken during the 2008 flood and the original Union building has been dwarfed by the expansions. In 1959, the Robert H. Finkbein estate willed monthly payments for the rest of their lives to three of Mr. Finkbein's former employees. And after the Finkbeins established their lumber business in southern Mississippi, they gave much support to that community. This included the donation of 800 acres of land to an agricultural, agricultural boarding school for African Americans. And in the 1980s, the Finkbein family members donated over $300,000 to Living History Farms, the largest donation to the farms up to that time. Collectively, the Finkbeins left their mark in many parts of Iowa, and this included gestures of their generosity. Our wonderful Finkbein golf course is named in their honor although its land was not part of the original donation. The patriarch of the Finkbein family, Robert Spencer, built his reputation on his keen ability in the building trade and his high integrity. Evidence points to the fact that his sons, the apples, did not fall far from the tree. In 1930, a memorial given to no other alumnus of the university up to that time was created for W.O. Finkbein in the form of this oil painting. The Finkbeins should be remembered for their lifetimes of deeds more than just a golf course. Thank you. And here's my contact information if anybody wishes to reach me.